Welcome back to Room 303 in Senior B English, and we now turn to Unit 5 in our My Perspectives text, Discovering the Self, Individual, Nature, and Society. I'm with you on page 538 and following. Notice your unit goals on 540, your academic vocabulary, especially as it relates to personal narrative on 541. And now we turn to the launch text, the narrative model on 542, 543, Early Dismissal by Robin Wasserman. Notice this is a personal narrative. This is what you'll be writing at the conclusion of Unit 5, a type of writing in which an author tells a true story from his or her own life. You will write in this mode for the performance-based assessment at the end of this unit. As you read, look at the details the writer includes about herself and what she wants, how does she, her sense of self change throughout the story. Notice we have 11 paragraphs, although a couple of those paragraphs are one-sentence paragraphs. You do have your notes section for annotating. Let's go ahead now and turn to the reading, and we'll take some good notes as we prepare for unit number five. Early Dismissal by Robin Wasserman, Personal Narrative. When you're a rational, clear-eyed, culturally conversant, healthy, mature, and stable grown-up, there are certain fundamental facts you know about the world. One of which is that 12-year-old girls come in only two varieties, the ones on the cusp of dumping their best friends, and the ones who will be dumped. The corollary to this is that it would be rather inappropriate for any rational, clear-eyed, culturally conversant, healthy, mature, and stable grown-up to care, much less still hold a grudge. I was born to be a dumpy, the epitome of quiet and bookish, with oversized glasses stuck to my face since nursery school, and an oversized helping of glee at any opportunity to be the teacher's pet. I was easily bored, easily charmed, and easily led. A ready-made sidekick to the school's resident, if relatively mild, wild child. I was also, having been reared on the steady diet of Anne of Green Gables, well-versed in the pursuit and cultivation of kindred spirits, and desperate to get one of my own. Once I finally did, it was as if I morphed into a 50s cheerleader who just scored a varsity bow, obsessed with the trappings of my new status. Instead of letter jackets, fraternity pins, and promise rings, I coveted friendship bracelets, science project partnerships, manic sleepovers, and above all, the best friend necklace, which could be broken in two and worn by each of us as a badge of our unbreakable bond. But the reasoning behind it all was the same. These were talismans, proof to the world that I was no longer an I, but a we. Don't get me wrong, I liked my best friend well enough, just not as much as I liked having a best friend, any best friend. I was a frightened child, not to mention an only child, and my best friend was my security blanket. The universe is guaranteed that I would not face the future alone. She was also my mirror, a far more flattering mirror than the one hanging on the back of my bedroom door. Her very existence was evidence that I couldn't possibly be that ugly, that awkward, that unlovable, because she was perfect, and she not only loved me, but loved me best. So you can imagine my surprise that sixth grade day in the playground when, lurking in corners as I was wont to do, I overheard her casually tell some new group of admirers that, no, I wasn't her best friend. Why would anyone ever think that? That was it. <coughs> no dramatic breakup scene. No slammed books, no rumor mongering, no cafeteria shutting, no mean girl antics whatsoever. Which was almost worse, because if I had become her worst enemy, it would at least have been an acknowledgement that I was once her best friend. Instead, from that moment on, I was nothing. It was the first time in my life it had occurred to me that kindred spirits might not last. That life, no matter how many talismans of attachment you accumulated, would be a constant struggle against being alone. There would eventually, at least after I'd crossed the social desert of junior high, be other best friends, better ones. But much as I may have believed in those friendships, I have never again taken it for granted that they would last. In the real world, the grown-up world, People leave, people die, people sometimes just get bored and move on to another part of the playground. Anything can happen. There are certain fundamental facts that 12-year-old girls know, while grown-ups, even the wisest of us, have forgotten. The names of Magellan's ships, the difference between mitosis and meiosis, the formula to calculate the volume of a cube, and the fact that BFF is not meant to be ironic. Knowing that no one's guaranteed to stick around has probably made me a better friend, 
And I'm certainly a better accessorizer now that I've left the ratty friendship bracelets and plastic necklaces behind. But I'll admit, I would like to go leaving in forever. All right, let's turn now to uh, this narrative for a few moments. Uh, it is a brief narrative, but I think in some really profound ways it captures the heart of what it means to mature, and as well what James Joyce would focus on, as well as Proust, the notion of the epiphany. That moment when you come to realize something you didn't know before, and you go, ah, oh, the world will be forever different now that I've had this experience and this awakening, this realization. Notice, she begins with a wonderful tone of voice. So write that in your notes, Margin. The tone here, it's, it's, it's childlike in its innocence, but it's also very mature in its ability to look back and reflect. Notice, she will begin by saying that when I was a kid, there were two varieties of 12-year-old girls. That is to say, there was, there, the world was easily divided up into, into dualities. Notice she describes herself with a powerful symbol, this notion of what she longs for best, the best friend necklace. And, of course, she thinks she has found her ideal. Now, she will say in paragraph four uh, that she thinks she has found the ideal. Now, in 3B, when we are working at our entertainment levels, it's easy for us to remember a time in our life when we were thoroughly convinced we had found the one best all, be all, best friend of all time, only to discover in paragraph five the epiphany that no, she isn't at all her best friend. She says, it's from this moment, moment on that she begins to come to terms with what it means to have to live alone. And ultimately, of course, she says it helped her understand the power of relationships that nothing really can last. And that is significant as she finishes that BFF in the younger years is not to be ironic. In other words, everyone in that age always thinks absolutely this is the way things are going to be forever, and of course, it ends, up, it ends up not being that way. Some of you smiling because you're already thinking of a moment in your own time when that happened. On page 544, I want you to just briefly summarize this. On 545, I want you to spend some time with this problem. What types of experiences allow us to discover who we, and then I hope you circle the word really, really are. And go ahead and spend some time. We'll come back. We'll do some conversation. And ultimately, you'll be doing some writing along these same, these same lines. Thank you.